Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. My name is Risa Eldon, and I'm joining on behalf of Ivy, which is a business management platform for home professionals. And here with us today, we have Ann Sage and Liza Coors from Embello, joining from Los Angeles, sunny Los Angeles, except I don't know if it's so sunny there, because it's definitely not sunny. <laughs> we had some fog, but now it's happening. Good. Fog exists everywhere in California. It's a real thing. So while everybody's joining and introducing yourselves, tell us where you're joining from. I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about these lovely ladies. And we'll tell you a little bit more about Ivy at the end of our session. Um, but definitely one of our big goals at Ivy is to not only give you a software to help you run your business, but also give you the education to help you take your business to the next level. So what are we here for today? We are going to learn a little bit about the power of influencer marketing. And Bello was started a couple years ago, right, Liza? Gosh, was that last year? Last mm -hmm. year. Yeah. So quick and has grown really, really fast over the last year. And Bello is the only home focused influencer marketing agency and platform where brands get matched with top design influencers. And Bello has taken all of the complexities of the influencer marketing process and streamlined them to save you time and money truly aligned with what we like to do at Ivy is save designers time and money and help, help you focus on what you love doing the most design. From finding the right partners and creating effective campaigns to monitoring workflows and digesting complex analytics so you can focus on your creative and business goals. Liza, um, previously I have met you in your previous role when you were the marketing manager at Barclay Butera and you do some writing for California Home and Sign and then Anne, um, obviously I'm sure you guys know who Anne is. Um, she is just so many different things. Um, founder of, co-founder of Rue Magazine, um, designer, stylist, you name it, Anne does everything. Um, and so I think that the two of them really, they've created this dynamic duo and I'm just so excited to hear what you guys have to say today. So I'll kind of throw the reins over to you ladies and let you tell a little bit about yourselves and what you do and what you're gonna teach us today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much for having us, Risa and Ivy. We're super excited. I know that over 500 people registered for this webinar, so it was just really great and exciting to hear that so many people are interested in this topic, but also want to learn about how to be a top design influencer. And so I think that's our goal for today is to really provide all of you with some really good examples and knowledge so that you can take that back and really become successful with this in your own business. And so should we get started with the presentation? Yeah, let's get okay. started. Okay, so we'll jump right in. So just to give a little background, you know, I started this company in Bello not only to facilitate relationships within or between influencers and brands, but also to really help along the process. There's still so many unknowns. Influencer marketing is still a new-ish industry, what, only over 10 years old. And there's a lot of just processes and things that are still unknown, both on the brand and on the influencer side. And so really that is, other than doing partnerships, really educating on what the process should be and best practices. And so that's what we'll, concentrate on today. And going through the agenda, we'll give a quick overview as to what influencer marketing is, the benefits, um, how to really create a strong media kit, which will be essential for you working with brands. And we'll give you some awesome examples that we have as well. Um, we'll dive deep into how to really communicate your value to brands and how to price yourself with, again, some awesome examples that Anne has with her experience in working with brands for over 10 years. Also, not only understanding your metrics, but really where to find them too. Sometimes people don't understand where to find them on your own social platform and that's okay. So we're gonna walk you through that as well. And then we'll close it out with just some of our best practices and tips in working with brands. So the, this is the agenda, this is what I kind of went through. And then we'll just jump right in and talking about, you know, what is influencer marketing? And so influencer marketing is a type of marketing that instead of brands reaching their target audience or demographic directly, 
they instead partner and collaborate and hire influencers to really drive that message for them. And so they understand that influencers have really built up this dedicated and super engaged audience and they want to tap into that audience. And, you know, another thing with influencer marketing, too, is that it it comes off as a little bit more organic and authentic because it it's not so much of a sales pitch. You know, it's almost like your friend is sort of recommending these products to you and you're being inspired by them. And so it's like I mentioned, a little bit more organic way to to drive that message and sell your products. Um, and so I thought what would be nice is to go through just some numbers as to influencer marketing and really what the impact it's made because it is a newer industry, but it's really exploded in so many other industries. And I think home is finally starting to recognize how important it is. And so, you know, there are over 1 billion people on Instagram alone. There's 2.2 billion people on Facebook. There's 1.9 billion people on YouTube and over 200 million people on Pinterest. People are on social media. We're on it every day. We're all guilty of it. I pick up my phone. It's literally the first thing I do is like scroll through my feed. And we're on social more than ever now. And on average, we spend over two and a half hours a day on social platforms and messaging apps as well. So brands recognize this is where people are. I think also an important thing to know is that now there are actual budgets for influencer marketing and 86% of marketers actually have a dedicated budget for influencer marketing. So there, this is becoming a really important part to an overall marketing strategy and earned media value. So over five times per every dollar spent. And so really what that means is that for every dollar that you allocate, to influencer marketing, you're getting over five times for what you would spend on any other traditional digital type of marketing. So it's really becoming super valuable to an overall strategy for a brand. So just so just to clarify my understanding of this earned media value, the way I understand that is if a brand spends a dollar on a magazine ad versus spending a dollar on influencer marketing, they see five times more of like Impressions a, a return. Engagement Got it. On Got that it. same money that you would spend. Cool. Yeah. So it's like five times more impactful than traditional media. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. All right. Am I an influencer? All right. I have been tasked with talking about this to you guys. And an influencer, am I an influencer? I know a lot of you guys, since you came to us through Ivy, are interior designers and maybe don't have like a million followers on Pinterest or Instagram. And what I want you to know and to really stand confidently in is that, yes, you are an influencer. You are already influencing the purchasing decisions that your clients make. You're influencing style and trends. So you're absolutely an influencer. And if you have a social media following, even if it's only 5,000 people on Instagram, that's actually incredibly valuable because those 5,000 people who are following you are what we call an engaged audience. Unless you've bought those 5,000 followers, which I highly doubt any of you have done, um, those 5,000 people made a decision to follow along because they liked your style, they liked your voice, they wanted to hear what you had to say. So yes, you are an influencer. And I get a lot of questions from people who have smaller followings and there's like this confidence piece that's missing. And I really want to encourage all of you to, to embrace the idea that you, you have the power to sway what people think and when it comes to working with brands to sway what people purchase. Um, and then, you know, we call this slide the benefits of, of putting on your influencer hat, but this could also be called opportunities. Like what are the opportunities available to you if you start thinking of yourself not only as a designer, but as a design influencer with this really engaged audience? There's 
tons of opportunities that you can be tapping if you simply start um, you know, thinking of yourself as an influencer and conducting yourself as one. So obviously building brand relationships is one of those. I'm sure you already have vendors that you work with regularly and you can really strengthen those relationships if you give them the opportunity to reach this loyal and engaged audience that you have. Another thing is growing your social presence to build your own brand more. So getting new customers obviously is a, a great one. Um, you can have fun creating content. So I know one thing a lot of interior designers come to me and say, and I relate totally, uh, it's, it's really hard to both do your design work but also think about creating content. But if you're starting to think of everything as just like this big beautiful puzzle that all feeds into each other, your projects become your content and Brand opportunities mean that you can get access to product for those projects, which becomes even more content. And maybe you're perhaps getting some budget from brands to be creating even more beautiful content. So like it starts to feed into each other and snowball. Um, and then last but not least, obviously, is maybe there's some compensation in it for you. And if you have a small following, it it's probably not going to be, you know, the, the $20,000 that you know, Vanessa Hudgens makes for an Instagram post. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, if you're a working interior designer and you're supporting a family, a hundred or two hundred dollars for an Instagram post, like or even a thousand or even a thousand, yeah. like that's, that's not anything to sniff at. Mm -hmm. So I really like, I can't emphasize it enough. Embrace the idea that you're already an influencer and start acting like one. I think too, to the first two bullet points of you know, building those relationships, but also growing your own social. You know, a lot of designers might not have the ability to do licensing with brands. Mm -hmm. And this could be an opportunity to sort of open up or start working with brands. And who knows, it could potentially lead to a larger partnership down the road. I think it's always a really great way to continue to build your own brand and align yourself with companies and brands that also fit with what your brand is saying and that way you can grow together. Yeah, absolutely. Like yeah. you never know what might open yeah, up totally. through this type of work. Okay, so let's dive into how to create a winning media kit. And a media kit should really be what you are going to present to the brand, why the brand should work with you and you know, think of it as your own portfolio that you would present to a potential client or a resume. You know, this should be a really good snapshot of, of what you have to bring to the table. It shouldn't be too long. It should be nice and concise. Um, but yeah, let's dive in a little bit deeper. And this is our media kit that we use at Embello. And to clarify, people like you put this together if a designer signs up on Invello, is that Correct. right? Yeah, exactly. And so if you sign up on Invello, you would receive a media kit like this. And so we'll go in a little deeper into each section to just make sure that you are capturing all of the information that brands would want to see in order to decide if they want to work with you. So this might seem obvious, <laughs> but putting your name, you know, large and in charge front is really important, but we really like having a small sort of tagline and it could be short. I call it like that Twitter tagline where it's only a certain minimum characters of really who you are, something punchy. And so with Anne, you know, blogger, designer, and author in Los Angeles, and then you can provide a, a longer, more detailed bio of, of who you are. And I think Another thing too is to make sure that your personality really shines through here. So have fun with it. Make sure you know that it really is your brand voice as well. Um, a headshot, of course, is super important. And then making sure that all of your social media accounts are listed. Um, you'll also, if you're doing your own media kit, want to include your contact information. Since we are the agent, our contact information is essentially on this, so that's why you don't see that here. But wanted to point that out as well. I also just want to take an opportunity to say, 
this is the type of information that should be on your Instagram bio too. I see a lot of people who have maybe a little too much fun with Instagram bios and really it should be a snapshot like this is here where you talk about what you do. Maybe you say you have a couple pets that you love, but, <laughs> but really make sure it's clear who you are and how people can reach you when they come to your Instagram main feed. Yep. Perfect. Okay. The next part are your stats. And, you know, we know that fit is obviously a really important part with brand collaborations, but brands also really want to see numbers and they want to see if they work with you, you know, obviously what the number of followers you have, but what's becoming more and more important is your actual engagement. So how many people are actually commenting, liking, sharing, saving your posts, um, and we'll go into a little bit more detail as to what each of these mean and where you can find them. Um, but just wanted to point out that these metrics should be on your media kit. And it also depends, you know, here, this campaign was very focused on Instagram. You can also include your monthly um, blog visits. You can also include Pinterest, if you're YouTube, you, you know, make sure to include the stats of all the platforms that, that you're a part of. Okay, so going into demographic data. So brands will be very specific when we work with them as to who their target audience is. And that's really a, a really big important uh, part for us when we put together campaigns is, is really getting to know who they're looking to reach. And for some brands, for example, we worked with a brand that was looking to partner with California designers. And so it was really important for us to know that they were their audience was focused in California or LA or Northern California. Um, another brand that we worked with was more focused on, actually they had a more male driven audience. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to tap into that. And so knowing you know, your gender breakdown, what your top cities are, what your audience uh, age ranges as well. You know, some brands are, trying to tap into more of the millennial market. And so understanding that you can reach that market is really important. So making sure that this is really highlighted on your media kit is definitely yeah. important. And we're gonna tell you, for those of you who don't know how to find this info, we're gonna let you know how to find it. So don't worry about that. Yeah. And then I think also it's really important to point out that this type of meaty, juicy information is what brands love about influencer marketing. Because think about an ad in El Decor. Like you don't know who's looking at that ad. It's kind of just throwing spaghetti at the wall. Whereas with influencer marketing, having this information available for brands, you can really convince them they're going to reach exactly who they want. And that's why those ad dollars go so much farther. Yeah, I think being able to make data-driven decisions on the brand side mm -hmm. is super important. And this definitely allows them to do that. Yeah. Okay, and then finally, you know, I mentioned before, fit is super, super important. So giving examples of your work and past collaborations, and even maybe some skills that you have could be, you know, really important for the brand to know. You know, if you are a super ultra modern designer influencer, you wouldn't necessarily take work with a brand who's more traditional. Mm -hmm. You always want to stay true to what your brand uh, represents, and you know, it's it's a two way street. Brands want it to fit on their end and you also want it to fit within your content as well yeah and visuals are always really great yeah have content. all all the visuals and partnerships that you're most proud of and when we say partnerships it doesn't have to be something that you made money from it could mean that maybe you know your local showroom asked you to sit on a panel at, mm -hmm. at a at a um an sure. event and that counts as a partnership you can yeah. absolutely put that down yeah Okay, let's talk about money. Okay, let's talk about money. How to price your work. So this is something that I get really worked up about. Liza has seen me get worked up about this. And it's one of the reasons why I got involved with Embello is because a lot of times a brand in the home industry, but in any industry will say, well, why can't I just give you some product and you put it on Instagram and like you're getting free product. So you should just be happy with that. Um, but the truth is that 
a lot of work goes into you creating and maintaining the trust and engagement of your audience. And brands absolutely get to pay for the privilege of access to the, the, that audience. So you're not like, just as you wouldn't do a design project for free, unless it was some kind of crazy, huge opportunity. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, like Vanessa Hudgens house. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I thought of her <laughs> anyway. Um, just as you wouldn't do an interior design project for free or, or let, a brand access one of your clients for free, nor should you let a brand access the trust of your audience for free. And the phrase that I use to, to describe that trust, um, I think about it as social capital, right? Like you can only talk to your audience about a brand so many times before it starts to feel like noise to them and they filter it out because they think they're they're being pandered to, right? So you have to be really careful about how much branded content you put on your feed and that's why brands get to pay that premium for being the brands that you talk about. So when you're thinking about how to price a, a paid partnership posts on your social feeds, there's different things to think about. Just as you would think about pricing your work for a design client, like yeah. how much time will it take to create this work? You, you wouldn't do $5 an hour for a design client. So if a post is gonna take you six hours to create, then you wanna be thinking about, well, how much money do I wanna receive for that six hours of work? Also, of course, what resources and materials will be needed if you have to go, you know, buy a bunch of flowers, hire a photographer, do all this subcontracting payments, um, and you're just going to break even on this post. Well, you know, maybe that might be beneficial if you're looking to build a long term relationship with a brand, but it's not going to be over time. Um, and then, of course, also this question of social capital. So um, a lot of a lot of my friends even, when I talk about what I do, they're like, oh my God, you get a thousand dollars for an Instagram post? Like, that's amazing. That a thousand dollars for something that takes you two hours to create, that's huge. You're like making like a top lawyer's fees. <laughs> and then I remind them, okay, well, sure, but I post maybe three or four sponsored Instagram posts mm -hmm. a month. Right. And Everything else I do on Instagram is unpaid work that I do to create and maintain that audience's trust. Plus the engagement. Plus the engagement, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I think what the point that I'm trying to get is a lot of times people come to me and again, there's this confidence and self-worth piece and they're like, who am I to be charging for content on my feed, but think about all the work and effort and energy that is going into what you're doing, yeah. and you deserve to get paid. Like you have bills to pay. It's right? probably very similar to a newer designer charging, mm -hmm. you know, the rates that they should be charging. It's kind of that similar exactly. feeling. Exactly. Okay. So, um, are you taking this one or am I? You are, but do you want me to skip this and just go straight to the examples? Um, so we go into. No, let's go back, let's go back. So so to that end, let's talk about pitching brands. Or if a brand comes to you and wants to do a partnership, let's talk about how to turn that opportunity into something that is paid or at least has a product value that you're receiving that is commensurate mm -hmm. with what you're putting into the partnership. So this is actually, just kind of like basic relationship building skills <laughs> that I've adapted into thinking about how to uh, stand up for myself in business transactions and price my work in a way that's fair. So think about, um, first of all, building the relationship, right? Like you're not just going to say to someone, give me 5,000 bucks for this if you don't know them, if they don't understand your value. So these are actual emails that are from, um, a collaboration I did with a furniture brand a while ago, and the 
the collaboration went beautifully from start to finish. And I'm really convinced it's because I followed these steps. So in terms of building relationship, and to be clear, this was a product trade for a space I was designing that I knew I was going to be pitching to press. And so it was going to get lots of great exposure. Right. It's a bigger opportunity. Uh -huh. after and, and we needed product in order to to decorate this space. Yep. So I reached out to my contact at the brand and I said very, very briefly, like this first email, concise and clear, here's who I am, here's the project. If you're interested, would love to tell you more. So one thing I hear from, from brands is a lot of influencers or designers will reach out and be like, I have a project, I need $10,000 in furniture. Right here's like the whole plan. And this first outreach is, is just think about like dipping your toe in the water, um, getting them excited, getting them excited and interesting, more. like yeah. dangling that yeah. carrot. Right. So then when they reply with interest, because who's going to say, no, we're not interested in a great partnership. Right. <laughs> and if they do say, no, we're not interested, then great. You've, you've not needed them fit. out. Right. Yeah. Um, so this is the second email is where you expand. And this is the one where I also like to add some visual inspiration. Yeah. So this, you can see this image up here is the PDF of the design board that I attached to the email and um, <clears throat> talked more about the specifics of the project, talked about the type of coverage that they could expect, and then also talked about the type of product we would like to receive in return. So, you know, if we think about that first email as me scratching the surface, <laughs> then that second one is digging a little deeper and really starting to paint a picture of the, what this could look the like. Vision the vision, it. right? Um, and also, I really want to point out this phrase, manage expectations. It is never too early to start managing expectations because as I'm sure you've experienced with design clients, the more everyone is on the same page from the beginning, the better it's going to be throughout the entire process. Yeah. And, and this is where you make it clear, like we need five things and you'll get five things in return and you can negotiate that, right. but just lay, lay the ground at work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is where it gets a bit nitty gritty, establishing value and thinking about this, like it's a transaction because quite frankly, it yes. is. Like my dad still thinks that I get free stuff all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I don't get free stuff. Often I receive product in exchange for work and services provided. And this is where I take that opportunity. Once it's clear the brand is interested to say, all right, here's exactly what we need. And here's exactly what you'll get in return. And I, I bullet it out just like in a contract. Sometimes I'll even create a spreadsheet with the, the oh, is the spreadsheet next? next? Great. Spreadsheet's next. I won't, I won't talk about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> so what we did was just like really clear deliverables. And I also want to add that this is something that Embello does for you because oftentimes in the past, my experience has been if these clear deliverables and expectations aren't laid out, then the brand thinks they're getting one thing, you think you're giving another right. thing, and it can get sticky later on. So again, right. this is a great example of managing those expectations. And that's where those campaign briefs, mm -hmm. having those put together as to what the actual deliverables yeah. are versus payment, all right. of that. And we'll, we'll talk process. about that later for a below. But, um, so yeah, this is, so this is the spreadsheet. So I'm going to go back to this really quickly here. You can say, see that we didn't include any kind of like dollar values because I had actually worked with this brand before and trusted that they, you know, more or less got the value yeah. of these deliverables that we were going to be providing. But this is a separate project. I had never worked with this brand before and I wanted them to really understand the, Yes, we were asking for $10,000 in product for a kitchen renovation, but the, the value. value of deliverables mm -hmm. that they were getting yep. was still above the, pro the value of the product. So these are examples of what I make when there is cash being exchanged 
for a paid partnership. Mm -hmm. So for example, recently I did a paid partnership with Amazon Home and I had my basic rates that actually, you know, Embello also sets basic rates. Mm -hmm. There's some industry standards yep. and I bulleted them out. You know, you're getting this many blog posts, you're getting this many Instagram posts. The value, if you add all of that up, is this right here. And then I bulleted out the value of all the product. So again, thinking about this like a business transaction, putting numbers to things takes away that nebulous, how's this gonna work out? Yeah. Is this side-by-side -side mm -hmm. comparison? Side-by-side so -side comparison, absolutely, absolutely. Because yeah. think about it, brands have shareholders to, d to talk to, they think in numbers. And so the more you can speak their language. Yes. Numbers the, are always good with Yes, the because... easier it is to get them on board. <laughs> yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Cool. Okay, let's talk more numbers. Yeah, let's keep talking numbers. <laughs> My favorite topic as a creative person, yay. Uh, so <laughs> let's go into talking about metrics, but we also understand that not everyone might not know where to actually find their metrics and that is totally totally fine and so to start off with just some basic things make sure that you have a public account make sure that that's <laughs> open and it will help not only with your engagement and your you know business but in order to be able to get analytics yeah making sure it's a public account and this is one of those things where it sounds obvious but you would be surprised how many interior designers have private accounts yeah. And if you're trying to build a business, it just not really it, useful. Right, exactly. And feel free if you want to take out your phone right now because we're gonna go through, you know, where to actually find these metrics as well. So if you have your phone handy, I'm sure you're looking at it. So just mm -hmm. open up your Instagram and we'll walk you through it. And we're talking Instagram specifically Specific. simply because we don't have a ton of time and getting into things like blog analytics and Pinterest analytics, that's a whole other separate webinar. Yeah, maybe we'll do a whole separate thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the other thing is making sure you have a business account. So mm -hmm. not only public, but a business account will allow you to be able to actually see these insights. So if you open up your Instagram and you look at one of your latest posts and you don't see that view insights in that middle screenshot, that means you don't have a business account. And so you wanna make sure that you have that set up so that you can find your in analytics. And it's not only important to be able to update your media kit and be able to communicate with brands, but also internally to see what of your content is actually performing the best so that you can produce more of that content. Maybe it's kitchens, maybe people love seeing your face or in action. This is really where people, where you can understand what works for you and you can create more of that content. But I do wanna say, stay true to the content you love as well because it's often obvious when a feed is all the content Over is created simply because of right. what does well. Right. That's so, the same truth you know, you are. like I'll throw in a shot of my kitchen on a regular basis because it always performs well, but I'm not going to only show my kitchen. Right. I like to keep it diverse. Diverse for sure. And I want to just um, point out to everyone this far left, how do we even get to this list of things? Because it might, it might not be obvious. <laughs> the way you get to this you know, archive insights activity list is if you're on your main profile, there's up in the top right corner, those three lines that looks like a to-do list kind of, if you tap on that, you'll see the screen slides open. Even. Yeah, that guy right there. So okay. go to your main feed, like your home, your city sage, and tap on that little guy up there, and then you'll open out that menu. And then you'll click into insights. And then, yep. And then insights will take you to just your back end of all of your analytics for your posts and your stories. We wanted to show you also another way to sort of get there a little bit maybe quicker on some analytics that brands would want to see is if you go to a, that specific post that you were working on collaboration with and actually click on view insights. And then you'll see still sort of a grade out of that post and then some basic analytics. So this will be your likes, your comments, your shares, and your saves, and then also your reach and your profile visits. If you swipe up, then you're gonna get 
full analytics. And then if you scroll all the way down, that's when you're gonna see what reach and impressions are for that post. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what those actually mean and why they're important. But those are the metrics that you are going to want to show the brand. And so that is where mm -hmm. you find them. And oftentimes a brand, and I know Embello does this, will ask you to take screenshots of this information after the collaboration is done so that they have a record of how well it did. Mm -hmm. And then also- Oh gosh. <laughs> you submitted these. I know, I chose, so I chose okay. the screenshots I sent you. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, this is just to show for stories and stories are a big part of of collaborations with brands. It's very interactive. You can also include swipe up links if you have over 10,000 followers or more. And so that's why it's very valuable to the brand because you can't necessarily put links in the actual post. Mm -hmm. And so this is where you can actually link to product that goes directly to the brand's website. And so going back to where you would click analytics, you would find where stories are and then you'll see a full library of your past stories you can then click into your story and then you can see analytics for that specific story. So you can see on the right here, these are all of your analytics. And I pointed out uh, the um, discovery, which is essentially your reach and then the impressions, because these are the two numbers here that are going to be, again, important on the brand side. Let me go back to make sure. Okay, good. I just want to make sure I didn't miss that on the other slide. So going, you have anything on this? No. Okay. Uh, so let's go into what all of those terms actually mean. Mm -hmm. And so what I highlighted here are your likes. These are your comments. These are the shares and these are the saves. And so this is the engagement that your post actually received. And so this is, you're gonna want to actually add these up to provide the brand what your total engagement was for this post. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes. Cool. <laughs> um, you learned something today. Okay, uh, this is actually a great opportunity great, great to, to say, like, um, this is always changing because the industry is always changing. New features for analytics are always being added. So I've been doing this for almost 12 years and you still learn new things every day. So and stay curious and don't yeah. feel bad if there's like terms you don't, you don't understand because yeah. we're all just kind of feeling yeah. around in the dark on this together. Totally, I mean, there's things like your stories go or your posts, your stories go away after 14 days. So you won't be able to go back to those. You analytics. mean the, the analytics for your stories? The too. analytics. Got yeah, it, exactly. okay. So That's really important. If a brand wants you to take screenshots of the analytics for a story, be sure to do it within 14 within days. The, usually you wanna do it after the, the 24, 24 hour period. Hours, sure. But in case you aren't able to, definitely within that 14 day period or if it's something you put in your highlights exactly or you can put it in your highlights and then it, you it'll can actually, keep getting views yeah. yeah so going into what reach actually is so reach is the number of unique accounts that actually saw that post and so i went to i'm scrolling through i saw ann's post i'm one unique user that actually saw that post. Mm -hmm. Now, say I was like, oh my God, that kitchen is amazing. Where did she get that faucet? I you know, want to know more about it. I kind of go back into it. Maybe I actually want to save it for mm -hmm. the future. So impressions is actually the number of times people saw that post. And so multiple users can see a post, you know, throughout the period of time that it's actually live. And so that's why you'll see the two different numbers and impressions will normally always be more mm -hmm. than reach. Now, engagement rate. We keep talking about how important engagement rate is to influencer marketing. Not only the number of followers, but how many people are actually interacting with that post. And so what that means is that you will want to divide these numbers up here so how many people actually took an action on your post divided by the number of times your post was seen. And that is how you will get your engagement rate. And there's some average out there, averages out there of what is the best sort of range to be in for performance. Usually you wanna stay between three to 5% 
on your engagement mm -hmm. rating. And I, I think when you have a smaller account, like if you're one of these mm -hmm. five, 10, 15,000 follower accounts, your engagement's gonna be really, really high. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And actually, that's one of the benefits why sometimes brands want to work with micro influencers is because they know that they have a higher engagement where working with more of a macro influencer, it's going to be a little bit more about brand awareness. Mm -hmm. So how many times was it, was it actually seen? Mm -hmm. And there's value for both. Value for both. Totally. It just depends on the goals of the brand. Yeah. Okay, and then lastly, we want to just talk about how important it is to still, if you have a blog, maintaining your blog and just understanding, you know, some of the metrics to to be able to provide the brand. You know, page visits and views are are essential on if you're writing a blog. And brands see this as a value because it increases SEO not only on your side but then also on the brand side. And this again is where you can also put in links. So you can put links back to a certain product or their actual website. And so it, it really helps a little bit more with yeah. that engagement. But again, blog traffic and engagement and SEO, that's a whole other webinar. We yes. just wanted to kind of touch on it and say, if you are a designer who's wondering if a blog is a valuable tool for building out your influencer profile, um, and you feel like it's something you have bandwidth for, then then absolutely I think it's valuable. Yeah. yeah. And I think too, just it might sound, you know, basic, but make sure that your Google Analytics is set up to your blog so that again you can look at your metrics as to what's working and then also being able to communicate those numbers mm -hmm. out when you need to. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're getting to the tail. Yeah, now. we're getting close. <laughs> so let's go through some best practices. Do yes. you want to? Yeah, I will, I will start because I am daily amazed at how brands and influencers that I interact with aren't familiar with some of these basic kind of common courtesy business transaction rules. So yeah. first, of, and it causes problems. It can really cause problems if you're not keeping these things in mind. Yep. Treat this brand partnership just like you would any client transaction in your design practice. So just as you wouldn't take on a design project without a signed statement of work and contract, yeah. you definitely want to get a signed contract with the brand for this partnership. Yeah. Just like you wouldn't do work for free with a brand partnership, even if it's just product being received, you want to make sure that you're speaking to your worth okay. so that the product or payment you're receiving is commensurate with that. I think also on the other side too, on, on the influencer side is, is again, treating this as you would your own design business. And, you know, we've come to some situations where yes. we've received, you know, concepts for, for an actual post. And then once we get the final post from the influencer, it's completely different than what was approved by the brand. And that's okay. You know, things change, projects change, things happen. But we're going to talk about communication. One is definitely communication, but it's the same thing as you wouldn't, you know, if your design client approved a living room design, you wouldn't then just show up with a completely different design and say, hey, like, hey, I bought you this purple couch, <laughs> even though you wanted a white one. Like, it doesn't. So treating this exactly yeah. like a business, uh -huh. I think, is just going to help throughout the entire process. Yeah. So you touched a little bit yeah. on this, but making sure that you have a contract and we have our contracts that we use and just making sure that it, it clearly defines what you're getting paid, but also what the actual deliverables are so that there's just no miscommunication mm -hmm. on that. And also, you know, things like image rights. If if you're including that into your contract where the brand gets to use those images for their own marketing materials and their own social, you know, those are some things that need to consider as well. Yeah. Yeah. And like we saw in that email thread that I shared with you guys, like we didn't draw up a separate contract in that case, mm -hmm. that email that had all those clearly bulleted points um, that served as our contract because that was a product trade. What I would say is that if there is actual payment mm -hmm. being, um, yeah. being delivered, uh, 
a contract contract that people have signed is yep. for sure recommended. Yep. And then going a little further, once you actually start working on a collaboration with the brand, a campaign brief is essentially everything that's outlined of what you are going to execute for that campaign. So visual guidelines, messaging guidelines, the, the number of deliverables, again you know payment and things like that mm -hmm. so making sure if you have any questions that it's all outlined in this clear concise campaign brief. yeah yeah and i can't tell you it's getting better now as best practices are kind of being um practiced more mm -hmm. by influencers and brands but there have been so many times when a brand kind of said that i had full artistic license and then i've delivered work to them and they've been like this this isn't what we wanted at all mm. um and so this is where sometimes it really is up to the influencer if it, the brand is new to working with influencers yeah. to get on that phone call and say are there specific types of images you have in mind mm -hmm. can you provide me with examples yeah. what are your goals for this campaign really get in there and understand what it is they're hoping to receive and then speak it back to them. Okay, what I'm hearing you say is this. Yeah. What I'm hearing you say is that you want light, bright, clear imagery with your product front and center. Living room shot. Living room kitchen, shot. You know, you know being as specific get as possible. so specific. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have a written record of it because I'll tell you, brands will come back and say, no, this is this is not what we talked about. And you, I've literally had to screenshot and be like, oh yes. This is, is exactly what it we is. talked about. And I'm happy to reshoot the material, but you're gonna pay me for it. Right, exactly. And I think that's also where the creative concept, that's a part in our process mm -hmm. that we think is essential to a campaign is being able to show what you are going to do for the brand. And that can be as simple as some inspiration photo of either some past work, or it could be other work as well, or a mood board we've received mm -hmm. before, but just something to, visual that the brand can actually approve in order to move forward. Yeah, with and, that and also with that visual, a written description of yes. what you're gonna do. Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I am going to be, you know, for this holiday campaign, there will be three images of a holiday tabletop, one from the front, one from the side, one from the top, and each one will you know, keep your product front and center. Like that lets them know what they're gonna get. And it gives them the opportunity at that stage before you've actually done the work to say, actually, we were thinking this, could yeah. we do this instead? And it saves so much time and money so much time than and money. when you're actually producing that content. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this part, we mentioned it before, but I think you know, getting feedback from the brand as to what you're creating. But the reason why brands are working with you is because you are the expert. You, they want to tap into that audience and you've been able to maintain your audience until this point just fine without anyone else, you know, telling you what to do. And so, yes, there might be some feedback as to, particular messaging that they want communicated you know maybe there was a point you didn't quite hit that they wanted or you know more on the messaging side but staying true to your brand really and you know again it might go back to working with brands that truly align with your brand to begin with but making sure that you're not changing your image just to please the brand mm -hmm. as well yeah and that can that can become an uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. I'm not going to lie, yeah. which is why uh, an agency like Embello is great because you're the middleman yeah. that has that uncomfortable conversation on behalf of the influencer. Exactly, because you want to keep you know that relationship positive and not have to. Yeah, it's like worry about that bad influencer gets to be the good cop, <laughs> and Bello gets to be the bad cop or the bad cop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then we can't express. It enough yeah. just communication if there's anything that you have questions on you know definitely make sure that you're clarifying everything from the beginning to, from the contract to campaign brief to post approval mm -hmm. you know I, I just communicate as much as you as you can throughout the yeah. process managing expectations and I think this word timeline that it, like it's the first time it's popped up in this presentation but one complaint I know I hear from brands especially um, 
when it's just a product transaction taking place is that they'll send a product and then it's like six months later it appears on their feed. And that's not really useful for a brand. So what I like to do is say, you know, my bandwidth is pretty small right now. I'm happy to receive it, but it might not be a month until I'm able to post it. Right. And having just even a guideline of mm -hmm. a time frame as to when you can expect to receive these deliverables, yeah. when it will be expected to be posted, even on the brand side, knowing, you know, when will they be able to ship that product? So yeah. that it might be back ordered and delivery times might take time. So, totally. yeah. So having a good timeline. Yeah. Um, and I think also when there is paid compensation happening, getting clear on that timeline up front and having it in your contract, which again, Embello does mm -hmm. for you. But if you're if you're working on your own behalf, be like, okay, product to be received by this date. Within two weeks, you'll have the images to review and approve. And yeah. then the, the content will be live on this date. And that just gives everyone, you know, a framework yes, to work a in. a framework, definitely. And then lastly, <laughs> we want to just say that, you know, don't think that the brands know this entire process. Like I mentioned, this is still a new industry. We're educating just as much on the influencer side as on the brand side and helping them throughout the process, what to expect, and don't rely on them to really be the experts. You know, it, it might actually look really great if you come to the table saying like, hey, we need this contract. This is, this is my creative concept. They might have never received that before from an influencer and they you know it's better for them to then work with you because they know that you're going to be organized and you are professional mm -hmm. and that you treat this like a professional transaction absolutely and that's how you retain and get return business because mm -hmm. there's a lot surprise surprise there's a lot of flaky influencers out there and if you're the one they can count on for clear communication meeting deadlines and being professional, you're the one that they're going to come back to. Yep. Exactly. Well, Is that everything? That's all we have. Questions. <laughs> I done? hope there's lots of questions because I love to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, that was amazing. I learned so much. I felt like I was like taking notes. And I definitely right. think the audience learned a lot too. And I think it's just a topic that we use all of these different platforms and it's it's really hard to digest um, all of the information and you guys broke it down in a very streamlined intelligent way and sometimes like you said just it's a business transaction and even seeing that excel spreadsheet like to me it makes so much sense and i've right. never thought about breaking it down like that and and then it's not just the person that you're working with or the brand or whatever, but they're showing it to their higher up and you have to explain the yeah. value. And, exactly. and, and I think this is something that crossovers, it, it, cross over, it crosses over a lot into what we talk about, um, just with helping a designer run their business the day to day and pricing out like how much they're charging for their services to the client. It's the same exact thing. It's just a different medium and a different end um, use case. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, your idea that like designers are influencing their clients decisions and if they have that mindset that they are thinking like an influencer it makes this whole part of the process easy we talk a lot um in and i've talked to a lot of designers about like affiliate marketing and and passive income and even like if designers on their instagram stories are saying like here's a product um you might not be able to afford a designer but here's a similar product and then the designer is making passive income it's just thinking smarter about how you're managing um, and setting up your business. And this might not be for everybody, but if this is something that you do want to partake, I think you need to have the foundation, the baseline um, to be able to understand if this is something that you can incorporate in your business. Totally. Yep, exactly. Um, okay. Well, this is a really quick, easy question. Um, well, it might not be easy, but um, I it, of all the questions that I, I think we could ask you. Um, is it true that you have to indicate in your post that it is a paid promoted post? So it it depends if it's a paid, if they're if you're actually getting compensated for with your work, money. With money, then yes, you need to indicate either hashtag ad or hashtag sponsored, or there's also the ability to tag paid partnership at the top. And so it's a preference. So yeah. so what I will say about that is the paid partnership uh, little 
like you know if you're scrolling through your feed and you see this like is a location. paid partnership mm -hmm. and it's on the top of the post that's a feature that instagram provides but that just using that feature alone does not satisfy the federal trade commission requirements for disclosing that you've received compensation the only thing that satisfies those ftc requirements is hashtag ad or hashtag sponsored. And what I will also say is that you are not required to use that Instagram feature by law. That feature that Instagram provides is something that Instagram wants you to use because right. they wanna be able to tell what percentage of posts are paid posts. Uh, but you don't actually have to use it in order for your post to comply with the FTC regulations. All you have to do is hashtag ad and hashtag sponsored. So this is, kind of like my dirty secret. <laughs> I don't use that paid promotion feature because I don't want the very first thing someone in my feed is to seize is that this is an ad because that's gonna increase the, the chances that they'll scroll right on by. And quite frankly, I'm proud of all of my work, even the sponsored work, because I go to great lengths to make it beautiful and engaging and inspiring. And I want people to see it and then they'll discover it's an ad. I don't wanna like set the tone right away, but I do always use hashtag ad or hashtag sponsored. But also I have to say, and I follow you and, and I know you, and I think that you partner with people, it's not like they're off brand. Yeah partnership so oh, even really? if it is an ad even if there's cross you know if you're paid or not paid or it's in front or whatever it's on brand it's something that you would use in your life in your yeah. projects um it's and and i've had a lot of people ask me that question and i know we talked about it a little bit earlier but if it's something that's really off brand that you don't believe in yeah. like don't yeah. go forward with the partnership i mean if it's mm -hmm. not a good fit and if you know, people, it, you will be surprised. Your audience will know right away. Yeah, if they, it's, they can if it's, smell it. Yeah, they'll know right <laughs> away when it's just, it's when it's not something that you would put out and that you actually believe in. And, and that's the reason why you have that engaged following is because they trust you and mm -hmm. what you're going to say yeah. and what you're, you're putting out there. And it's something that you also believe in and trust in mm -hmm. and, and we, use yeah and, myself and yeah. i've had many you know influencers who you know when we worked with the brand and we reached out to influencers and and they said it wasn't a good fit and that's totally fine mm -hmm. it's better yeah. to know up front and not make it work and then at the end no one's really happy yeah. you're not doing anyone favors by taking on the, right. the work that's a fit and that's including the brand what i will say though is I do love taking on brand partnerships that feel like a bit of a stretch for me. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is maybe it's a product where it's not obvious how I'm gonna talk about it. Some products it's easy, it's like, great, a table, I know how to talk about a table. Like but, but, you know, <laughs> like the mouth thing that we recently, that we showed. Cause Risa and I are both gonna get it. Oh, are you both getting <laughs> smile up? Smile yeah. up? Yeah, we still best. <laughs> I, I love challenging myself to think about, here's an unconventional product or service. How am I gonna make this visually appealing? How am I gonna make a mouth guard beautiful, right? <laughs> and like in my stories, it doesn't matter. Stories can be more candid. I can show pictures of myself, like taking my impressions for my teeth. But it was a stretch for me to think about, all right, I'm gonna use my beautiful bathroom and I'll do like an out of focus, blurred out image of me taking my impression in the background and then the product is in focus in the foreground. That's where I get to put on my art director. I was just gonna right? say, it's an opportunity for you to get even more creative. Mm -hmm. As exactly because it's not your normal yeah. styling and you know that you can kind of look up. This, for sure this takes a little yeah. bit more creative yeah because otherwise it gets boring if i'm just talking about like here's a chair go buy it yeah. and the other one that i really loved um i did a, a paid partnership with turbo tax a couple of years back mm -hmm. and it's like how how the hell am i gonna make turbo tax beautiful <laughs> like taxes are the ugliest thing in the world oh, I and, put it in and, yeah and we've used the mm -hmm. visuals from that and the brand was so happy with the visuals because i you know what i did was i styled a beautiful office vignette and i showed me working at my computer in my mm -hmm. cute outfit that i of course always wear when i'm working but but you know like the i really i love the opportunity to make a brand really happy yeah by doing what i do best which is making things pretty yeah and that actually to tack on to that somebody had asked 
for in terms of a designer, what are your thoughts on types of brands to work with? Um, like not just furniture companies, mm -hmm. you're asking like a variety of brands, like what's so many. Yeah. I, mean, I think with a designer too, like you can talk about entertaining is such mm -hmm. a easy related industry. And I'm sure you have a beautiful kitchen that's beautifully designed and working with more housewares type companies that might want to talk about bakeware or entertaining yeah. or blenders or vacuums. basically what I would say is if it's a product or service that you yourself use or you yourself recommend yeah. to clients, it's, it's a brand category that you could partner with. So yes, there's furniture, there's rugs, there's paint, there's tile, mm -hmm. there's, I mean, um, you know, different services like Ivy for designers, like yeah. more of that kind of tech side of things. Yeah. Like Liza said, there's appliances, vacuums, like there's everything. So Pet, yeah. pets, pets is yeah. a huge one. Pet is yeah. Kids. Kids stuff. Mm -hmm. Like if it crosses your path, Luggage. it's a valid product mm -hmm. category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And then um, when you have a project you're pitching and you need like, let's say wallpaper, can you pitch to multiple brands or choose one, or should you pitch to your top choice and wait on a yes or no before pitching the second choice? That's, that's I think that last answer, that's how I do it. I think it's very similar to how you wouldn't pitch and like- Magazine. Exactly, yep. a magazine and you know, and see who responds first. Really pick who it, you want to work with and, and go down that list and not until you receive a no, then move mm -hmm. forward to the next. Okay. Yeah, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is the very simple reason of how awkward would it be to have both brands say yes, and then you have to be like, oh, sorry, someone already said yes. Mm -hmm. But like energetically laws mm -hmm. of the universe speaking, I am all about getting clear on exactly what I want yeah. and focusing and going only for that. If I'm like, yeah. emailing five different wallpaper brands, then, you don't really know then what... my energy is not focused, but I've, I have a clear, picture of like okay i want the temp paper chinoiserie for this nursery and i'm just gonna single-handedly go for it yeah the odds that it's gonna happen are much better than if i'm like machine gun yeah all my wallpaper brands yep okay we have a couple more questions and we are over our time so if anybody has to pop off just wanted to let you know um sorry we're gonna run over just a couple minutes um, um, and his handle is city sage yeah everybody yeah. follow her it's the most it's beautiful city sage at city sage we'll drop all of that in i just want to answer a couple more questions if you guys want to stay with us um what level of followership and what kind do you need to break into the influencer market she said we have great design and photography but not a lot of followers what I would love to know, what do they mean by not a lot of followers? Yeah, I don't know if John's still with us, if she has um, any um, insight on that. But but I also think that like you shouldn't be threatened. Like if you don't have a lot of followers, like if you have beautiful design, I mean, it, yeah. it's so it takes even, time. Even if you have, like Anne mentioned before, 5,000 followers or even less. Yeah, there's you have that dedicated audience that you are that are engaged with your content, one. Two, there are brands that are also on that same level that mm -hmm. want to grow their own brand, grow their own social. And so they're gonna work with more micro level influencers because it's more aligned with their brand and you're kind of helping each other yeah, move and up the needle. let's be real, not every brand, especially in the home industry, because they're still kind of adopting influencer marketing, so maybe budgets. budgets aren't as big. Yeah. Not everybody has a $25,000, $30,000 marketing budget. Right. They might just have a few hundred dollars yeah. for a post, and you're the perfect person to do it for them. Yeah. So that goes back to what I was saying before about confidence and worth. Mm -hmm. If you truly believe in your work, yeah. which you, you know, which you should, because you're out there doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Then, then starting to act like someone whose voice is valuable, yeah, do yeah. it right now. Yeah. yeah, so don't be scared of the number of followers. I will also add that your engagement is super important mm -hmm. as well. So don't be stuck on the number of followers that you have. If you have a 5% engagement, that is amazing, and brands should really want to work with yep. you. Yeah, I agree. And I will add, Embello, sign up with Embello, super easy process. Embello creates brand partnerships with influencers of all following. Yeah, sources. and that was my next. That was the final question. You know, somebody had asked, like, how do you know when you're ready to engage with an agency? Um, what are what are like you said, like Embello? What are those next steps? Yeah, I mean, on the influencer side, it's super easy to sign up. You 
answer a questionnaire. We put together your media kit. We also work on the brand side where we help sort of strategize a different campaigns with the brand and then align them with the right influencers. So it, it does depend on some of the brands that we're working with because it might not always be a fit with that type of influencer, but we're working on all types of collaborations, even mm -hmm. events and things like that. And we have a lot of really exciting things coming up. So I think the best you know, first step is definitely to just to sign up and be part of our network. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. Anybody that wants to learn a little bit more about Ivy, stick with us. But thank you so much, ladies, for joining us today. And sorry to everyone for running a little bit over. So much good information. We will, of course, send you out a recording. And um, if we have Anne's permission, and I would love to take out Anne's address, we'll send you we'll over. Take out my we'll address you. before you send it. <laughs> um, yes, we'll send that over um, to you guys so that you can follow along. And hopefully this helps you guys really take your business to the next level. And thank you again, ladies, for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.